I have to do something now which uh, seems a little bit strange for a magician, but I'm going to take some medication. This is uh, a full bottle of Calm's Forte. Uh, I will take enough of these. Mm. Indeed, the whole container. Jesus Christ. Oh, that's nasty. This is um, uh, Calm's Forte, 32 caplets of sleeping pills. I forgot to tell you that. What? I just ingested six and a half days worth of sleeping pills. I... What? Six and a half days. That certainly is a fatal dose. It says right on the back here, in case of overdose, contact your poison control center immediately, and it gives an 800 number. Keep your seats. It's going to be okay. I don't really need it. Because I've been doing this stunt for audiences all over the world for the last eight or ten years, taking fatal doses of homeopathic sleeping pills. Why don't they affect me? <sighs> this is homeopathy debunked. So let's start by explaining exactly what homeopathy is. Put simply, it's an alternative medicine that asserts that illnesses can be treated with minute doses of substances that in large doses would produce symptoms off the illness. Or as the creator of homeopathy, Samuel Harnanen put it, like cures like. For example, aconitum is an extremely poisonous plant that causes, among other symptoms, nausea, headaches and diarrhea. And so homeopathic advocates assert that because influenza causes the same symptoms, a homeopathic remedy for influenza can be made from aconitum. Now on the surface, this might seem similar to how vaccines work, but it's not, and it's dangerous to think that it is. To quote Richard Dawkins, Unlike a vaccine that introduces a diminished form of a virus into the body in order to provoke its immune system, like cures like makes the unfounded assumption that what causes similar symptoms can cure those symptoms. Or in other words, vaccines prevent an illness by exposing the body to a small amount of the illness, which causes the body to create antibodies and become resistant. While well, homeopathy attempts to cure an illness by finding a substance that causes similar symptoms and then giving the body this substance in the smallest possible dose. Yeah, you heard that right. Homeopathy asserts that the smaller the dose, the more potent it is. So with that said, you might be wondering, how exactly is homeopathic medicine made? Well, to create a homeopathic remedy for influenza, for example, a homeopathic technician grinds aconitum into a very coarse grain, mixes it with either water, alcohol, or a combination of the two, and then thoroughly shakes the solution. From here, the technician then mixes one part of this solution with 10 parts water, alcohol, or a combination of the two, and then puts it through a process called succession, which is a deliberately verbose way of saying it's shaken. And finally, this process, which is called potinization, is repeated until the solution is as diluted as desired, which is normally 30 times, which, to put this into perspective, means that you'd need to drink 8 thousand gallons of the final solution to ingest one molecule of the original solution, which is more liquid than the average person drinks in 20 years. So yeah, these may as well be caffeine. Now I'd like to think that just knowing the principles behind homeopathy, how it's made, the fact that it deliberately obfuscates language, and the fact that it packages itself as if it's real medicine, would be enough to cause people to see it for the utter quackery that it is. But, if you're like me, you'll want hard science before you dismiss it entirely. And so, brace yourself. Peer review papers are coming, and this is just a handful of them. In 2005, the medical journal The Lancet conducted a meta-analysis of over 110 studies of homeopathy 
and 110 studies of matched conventional medical studies, and found that there was weak evidence for a specific effect of homeopathic remedies, and that this finding is compatible with the notion that the clinical effects of homeopathy are placebo effects. Or in other words, they found homeopathic treatment to be as effective as sugar pills. Moving on, in 2006, the European Journal of Cancer, who would endorse any successful treatment of cancer with open arms, conducted a meta-analysis of six studies and found insufficient evidence to support clinical efficiency of homeopathic therapy. And in that same year, the sympathetic Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine conducted a double-blind randomized control trial of their own, and even they found homeopathy to be no more effective than placebo. And as if this wasn't already enough, in 2015, Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council, which is one of the biggest medical authorities in the world, conducted an extremely rigorous meta-analysis of an unbelievable 1,800 studies and found that homeopathy causes no greater health improvements than placebo. Now fortunately, due to studies such as these, the NHMRC is not the only major medical authority to denounce homeopathy. In fact, most do. To name but two more examples, the British NHS has stated that there is no good quality evidence that homeopathy is effective as a treatment for any health condition. And the American FTC has stated that the FTC will hold efficacy and safety claims for over-the-counter homeopathic drugs to the same standard as other products making similar claims, which has resulted in all homeopathic medicine within America having to explicitly state that it's not accepted by most modern medical experts and that there is no scientific evidence that the product works. Now I've got to say America, that's cool. Good job. As a Brit, I'm jealous. But then again, when it comes to religion... Anyhow, now that we've established that homeopathy is pseudoscience, let's ask perhaps the most interesting question. Why do so many people claim to benefit from it? You put that down solely to the homeopathic remedy? I do. Definitely. Which cured his cancer? Yes. It worked for me. And I would say to other people, if you have problems, don't knock it. Try it. Well, to explain this, he's the fantastic YouTuber, Genetically Modified Skeptic. Thanks, Steve. There are several factors to the illusion of homeopathy's legitimacy to the unknowledgeable potential consumer. One is the intuitive and overly simplistic reasoning of common explanatory phrases such as like cures like. Such lines of reasoning pander to the lowest common denominator, making the supposed mechanisms behind homeopathy seem so obvious that they must be a reality. Another factor is the scientific sounding descriptors homeopaths often use for their various practices. This one is rather straightforward. Those marketing homeopathy use complex and technical sounding terms in order to give the impression that homeopathy is sophisticated enough of a practice to actually warrant such terms. Still, another is the fact that homeopathic substances are very often sold in pharmacies right next to evidence-based over-the-counter medications. All of these things together afford homeopathy some air of legitimacy. But still, I'm not convinced that there's a factor that legitimizes this nonsense in the minds of most users more than personal experience. Just like with religious people, you'd be very hard-pressed to find a believer in homeopathy that holds their belief on separate grounds from their own personal experience. Those who proclaim the benefits of homeopathy do so because they have, more often than not, perceived benefits of its use in their own lives. I guess like a lot of people, I fell in love with homeopathy because it rescued me in my darkest hour. I had a very interesting personal story that really cemented for me the value of homeopathy. What I experienced with homeopathy was absolutely incredible. But if homeopathy has been demonstrated not to work, how could so many have perceived its benefits? Likely the most common reason is the unchecked experience of the placebo effect. It's well known in the real medical community that the expectation of a symptom or a symptom's relief can actually create that symptom or its relief to a limited extent. This phenomenon is so common that in clinical trials of any given medication, researchers must compare the effects of the medication to the effects of placebo to ensure that the medication's effects are not more pronounced than those of simple expectation. By the means I've mentioned here, homeopathic substances and their purveyors create a powerful expectation in the mind of the user. 
This way, the user may perceive benefits of homeopathy even though it totes not a single effect in its own right. Another phenomenon that may explain the perception of benefit is the misinterpretation of a correlation between homeopathic treatment and the relief of symptoms or disease. Someone guilty of such misinterpretation might think something along the lines of the following. I had a headache. I used homeopathic treatment. My headache went away, therefore my headache must have subsided because of the homeopathic treatment. But as the scientifically literate know, correlation does not imply causation. And again, the medical community is so aware of the issue of conflating the two that certain controls are implemented in all clinical trials in order to ensure that the effects observed are definitely a result of the treatment being tested. Personal experiences do not have such controls and prove unreliable in accurately reflecting the effects of any single factor involved. Most simply put, a person might have the flu, use homeopathic treatment, get better, and then cite the miraculous effects of homeopathy when really, what cured them was their unaided immune system. These two possibilities are a huge part of the reason why anecdotes are not and should not be accepted as evidence for any medical treatment. However, upon closer examination of the culture surrounding much of alternative medicine, it's pretty apparent that people are actually encouraged, just as in religious circles, to cite their personal experience as evidence of their treatments of choice. Not to engage in too much tinfoil hattery here, but it does prove a shrewd marketing tactic to encourage your customers to embrace and tell others of their personal experiences with your product when your business is not allowed to make any medicinal claims. And mostly unrelated to my bit of speculation there, it does prove next to impossible to invalidate an emotion-packed personal experience to the one who holds it. Because of this, personal experience, although demonstrably unreliable, is fiercely defended as a means to prove the efficacy of homeopathy. Thanks for having me on, Steve. I really appreciate it. And to all those who are watching, I hope to see you over on my channel. Cheers, Drew. I truly appreciate your input, and I'm sure that you've intrigued my audience enough to check out your excellent content, to which there are links below. Please, guys, do check him out. It would be really, really cool if we could bump him to 3.5k subs. Anyhow, to recap, Homeopathy is quacktastic, pseudoscientific nonsense, and like all alternative medicine, it's dangerous because it encourages decent but ignorant people to take non-evidence-based products over evidence-based medicine, and the result is often, and needlessly, catastrophic. As always, thank you kindly for the view, thank you Drew for taking the time to join me in this video, and of course, an extra special thank you to my kind patrons. You are as always, awesome incarnate. Oh, and on that note, the winner of this month's Patron of the Month is Russell TJ. You've won the book Logically Fallacious by Bo Bennett. Congrats. I'll PM you through the back end of Patron with details. And finally, I'm going to leave you with a quote from Dara O'Brien. The great thing with homeopathy is you can't overdose on it, but you could fucking drown. Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, it seems harsh and I used to be much more generous about it, but right now I would take homeopaths and I'd put them in a big sack with psychics, astrologers and priests and I'd close the top of the sack with string and I'd hit them all with sticks. And I really wouldn't worry who got the worst of the belt of the sticks, right?